we've seen through an application that we can end up with a system of higher order differential equations. What we're going to want to do is convert that to a first order. And there's a number of reasons inside the course that this is a good thing. And also, if you ever take a numerical methods course following this, this is what software prefers in terms of its uh, the way you present differential equations to software. So if you're looking at a numerical methods course later on, then understanding how to do this transformation is going to be key for being able to use the software correctly and effectively. We're entering a new regime here where we're going to have matrices and vectors. So for those who have not taken linear algebra, we'll try to minimize the foreignness of what we're doing here, but there will be some terms used that will be very familiar to those who have taken linear algebra. We'll try to include everything you need within the course though. As part of that transition, we're going to use vectors with hats and for matrices or square arrays of values, we're going to use capital letters and any scalar values are going to be lowercase. We'll try to stick with that as much as possible. So as a reminder, we had our differential equations, plural, which involved two variables and two derivatives. So we had our two mass times accelerations and careful with the signs, negatives, negatives, positives, positives, a nice structure there. The challenge, the reason may not be obvious right now, but it's going to help us to go down to first order, so only first derivatives. How are we going to do that? Well, what we're going to do is invent a w vector, and it's going to have a very simple structure. It's going to be w1, w2, w3, w4. Okay, that's not too interesting. How does it map back to the variables here? What we're going to do is put x1 and x1's derivative in there. So the original x1 and its derivative. Only the first derivative though. We're also going to do the same thing for x2. Okay. So this is just defining a new variable called w1, which will be identical to x1. w2 will be equal to the derivative of x1, w3 is x2, and w4 is the derivative of x2. And we'll see how this plays out in terms of reconstructing our equations over here, or how we can express this in terms of the new variables. Our next step in the transformation procedure is to define the derivative of w as a vector. Well, that just means going piece by piece or element by element. So we're going to find the derivative with respect to time of w1. Well, w1, we said, was exactly equal to x1. That's how we defined it. Well, that's equal to x1 prime. So that's taking a derivative. And this is the definition of w1. And where does that get us back to? Well, that is equal to w2, because that's how we define w2. That might not seem immediately helpful, but follow along and you'll see how the pieces come together. The next variable that we'd like to take the derivative of would be w2. w2, which is the same as the time derivative of x1 prime, because w2 was equal to x1 prime, and that is equal to, well, one more derivative means x1 double prime. And here, this is where we bring in our physics. We have a relationship that involves x1 double prime. So we're going to bring this down. And what we're going to do, of course, is get rid of this m. We don't want it here. We want just x1 double prime by itself. So we'll have a 1 over m times everything inside there. So 1 over m times negative 2k x1 plus k x2. However, we're trying to write the derivative of these new w variables in terms of the w's themselves. With practice, this becomes more familiar, but in the first instance here, this may seem quite confusing. Let's just add a quick cheat sheet here again. We have our four variables that are new, and our original variables were x1, x1 prime, x2 and x2 prime. That's our mapping. So x1 
is w1. Same thing, they're identical to one another. x2 is the same as w3. So we can write the derivative of w2 in terms of the new w variables. Just bring this m1 over m inside, and there we go. So again, this might not seem like it's buying us anything yet, but it is leading up to a good finale, so bear with me again. The derivative of w3, what would that equal? Well, that's the derivative. w3 is the same as x2. So we swap in x2 instead to understand what's going on. Well, the derivative of x2 is x2 prime. x2 prime is in our list here. x2 prime is w4. And last but not least, the derivative of w4 is the derivative of w4 is x2 prime. Already one derivative, and we're taking a second, so it's x2 double prime, and this we get from the differential equation up here. It'll be 1 over m, bring this m over, times kx1 minus kx2. And we've already said, well, we have variables for those. This is better known as w1 in the new variable context. This is better known as w3. And so we have, at the end of the day, k over m w1 minus k over m w3. So we can define the derivative of all the new variables in terms of the new variables. And we're using, this is the important thing, we're using the differential equations that we started with. We're using the information we know about our spring mass, which otherwise looks like it's completely hidden in these calculations. Keep in mind, as we go forward, what we're going to be most interested in. We're most interested in predicting the position of the mass 1, that's x1, or in our new terms, it's w1. And we're also interested in predicting the position of the second mass over time, which is what we're calling w3 now. Here we have the derivative calculations recopied and simplified, but notice this is a set of four first order DEs. So we traded our earlier version, which was two times second order differential equations. So in total four derivatives running around, we were able to trade that for an explicit four derivatives, one of each variable here, and still maintain all the structure because we have our old differential equations hidden away in this new form. Our next step is to put this in matrix format because that's where we're going to be able to leverage some very powerful tools from linear algebra. So what are we going to do? We're going to talk about the derivative of the vector of four variables, w3, w4 here. That is going to be equal to something times a, a vector of those same unknown variables. So on the left hand side, be careful. We've got w1 through w4 are functions. Remember, they're like positions and velocities. So we can talk about their derivative and their derivative is on here on the left hand side. So we're just stacking this column here on the left and we're going to build the right hand side using what we have here, but also using matrix and vector notation. In particular, the derivative w1 is w2. What we're going to get here is the 0 times w1, 1 times w2, 0 w3s, and 0 w4s. So matrix multiplication again is across the rows and down the columns. That's the product we take when we multiply these two elements. And if we expand that product out, we get exactly this equation here. There has been no change in content. It's just the change in how we show it to you. If we do exactly the same thing in the next row, you'll see I need a coefficient of w1, which is negative 2k over m. There is no w2, so it gets a zero coefficient. And then we get a positive k over m and then there's no w4, so it gets a zero coefficient. If we do that same, I won't leave it on the page, but that same product, 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 
and add it together like a dot product for vectors, we are going to recreate perfectly this right-hand side. So again, we're not changing anything when we write this right-hand side the way we're doing it. We're just expressing this long, laborious list of coefficients and factors together in this new format where it's coefficients and then a column vector of the variables. Now I'd encourage you to pause for a second and think what the last two rows would look like here based on the pattern you've seen here and the rules for matrix multiplication and then we'll go through them. All right, the derivative of w3, the third row here, is w4. So no ones, no w2s, no w3s, and exactly one w4. The derivative of w4 has a k over m times w1. So we take the coefficient and put it in here. There's no w2s, and there's a negative k over m w3, and a zero for w4. It doesn't appear in this equation. And that has successfully converted our loose grab bag of terms here into something that's very, very ordered. And in fact, this is going to be an archetypal form. We have the derivative of a vector is equal to some matrix times the original vector itself. So a vector times this matrix is the same thing as the derivative of the original vector itself. With our new form of the differential equation in very compact notation, what can we do to maybe solve this differential equation? In other words, how do we get to w equals? Well, one of the great things that we did earlier in the course when we had these relatively simple differential equations was we assumed a form. And the form that we took was e to the rt. For historical reasons, I'm going to use e to the lambda t here. But the problem is that's not going to work because this is just a scalar. So what we might want to do is put some vector in front of that. And what we're going to do is have that just be a vector of constants. So this is a scalar function of time. And to get a vector out of this, we just multiply that by a vector, a column vector v. Well, with that assumption, what are we supposed to do? Well, as we did earlier in the course, we sub in and solve for those unknowns, the vector v and the scalar lambda. Well, if we take the derivative of w, so the left-hand side, is the derivative with respect to time of w. And we just said we think that looks like some vector times e to the lambda t. Well, this is a constant vector. So we can bring it out front of the derivative. And then the thing we're taking the derivative of is just a regular, ordinary, single variable function. And that will give us v times lambda e to the lambda t. What does the right-hand side turn into? Well, the right-hand side is a times our solution, or unknown vector w. But we just said from our assumed form that this should look like a vector of constants times e to the lambda t. And these two parts here must be equal if our assumption is correct. If it's not correct, of course, then we're totally off the rails. But we wouldn't be putting you through this if it wasn't if there wasn't some germ of truth in it. So let's write this out. We've got v, I'll bring the lambda out front, e to the lambda t is equal to a v e to the lambda t. Well, e to the lambda t and e to the lambda t are scalars, so we can divide by them. We can't divide by matrices, but we can divide by scalars. And if we do that, we end up with lambda v, which is equal to a v. And the important thing, again, if you haven't taken linear algebra, bear with us here, but this is a crucial distinction. This is a scalar value here, and this is a matrix value here. And this is one of the most famous equations in linear algebra. This relationship of saying, oh, if I've got a vector v and I multiply it by a, 
That's the same as just taking my v and scaling it somehow, multiplying it by some constant value. Then this is the famous eigenvalue or characteristic value, eigenvector, characteristic vector, that's all eigen means, uh, equation. For our purposes, the most important thing here is that this is a known quantity. We can go to the linear algebra textbook and look up this chapter and go, oh, I know how to solve for lambda and v once you give me the matrix A. So this is going to be something that we can work with and make some serious progress with using the same kind of ideas we saw earlier in the course, assuming a form, but now when we're working with multiple variables.